1979, I lived on Orange Street around Trinidad, Trinidad Northeast. My first band as a drummer. I, I didn't even know nothing about Go Go back then. 79, 78, 79. We had a band called Orange Sinclair's. Um, I was a drummer. My best buddy Kevin. Kevin, his brother named Miguel. Rest in peace, Miguel. Miguel was the leader of the band. So we had our little glitter shirts with our Orange Sinclair's. And Elmer's glue, you know, with our names on a shirt. We had, and I, what I remember what stood out, it was a song that we played. Uh, we played like Michael Jackson and stuff. But we had a jump we played called How Now Brown Cow. That, that, was, that was our hit, hit song for some reason. And after that, maybe around 7th, 8th grade, 1980, we had a band around uh, Holy Name. Uh, we had so many names. Uh, Eyes all crew, Ebony Funk, Young Essence, we had the kazoos, and I had the rototoms and the drums. So if you're a rototom player, and I didn't have Timbali, so if you're a rototom player, you know you don't got the six inch. So every time I would play the rototoms and the six inch would bust, I would make Martin or whoever the drummer was get all the drums, because that was my drums too. Because without the six inch, and you don't have no timbales, and we would turn the, the first tom over, on the drums and make that like a timbali. So you have the six, eight, ten, and the, uh, t uh, the drum tilted over for the five piece drums that turn into a, I guess, a four piece. We had a band playing around the neighborhood, playing a web, stuff like that, outside, playing in the basement. Me and Kevin, like I said earlier, is my best friend. We walked, just walked down to go to the Coliseum. For some reason, we never took Florida Avenue. We would go down to Wally Court and take 8th Street and walk all the way down to 3rd Street to go to the Coliseum. The band used to play right there while they caught the band named Reality Band. Dern, Dern Tate was a keyboard player. I knew Dern, funny thing about me and Dern, our history went, we didn't even do the history way back until my, my father's band, Mickey the Blazers, his father, uh, Joe Tate was my father's saxophone player. <laughs> It was so funny, but we didn't know that until as we got older, you know, because Joe wasn't living, you know, where, they, where the band was practicing. I used to go down there and mess around with the drums, roll the songs. Didn't know how to play congos, but I could play the drums and roll the songs. So uh, they had a congo player, and I, I think he got fired. Greg Googie, Big Googie. Googie told me, if you get some congos, you can play in, in this band, reality band. So, you know, me, I was spoiled. I go up the street, I go home, and I had my grandma called Googie, and she was like, is it is it true, V? If I get up some Congos, he could join this band? So, like, the next two days, <laughs> with them Chuck Levers, and I hear, it's so funny how I hear people say, man, we had raggedy Congos. I'm like, nah, that me. <laughs> I had fresh, fresh Congos right off the, you know, off the shelf. And it was so crazy, I never was going to the Coliseum or any any go goes really to hear, hear the Congos. My thing was the drums. I was a Sugar Foots fan. Foots was my man. I would go get on his drum set, Miss Mack, get all the drums, boy. You know, get all Tim and get all the drums when I get up there on the drums. Well, we went, got the Congos, and they had the same set. I don't know, a lot of people don't know. Jungle Boy had these black, like a chocolate gray black Congos, the two big ones. That had these white specks in them. Got the same ones for some, for some reason. I can't remember my my goon box. I can't remember the small ones, but I had all that because I got a story about the show reality band. Like you know, I go to band practice with Gooey. We practice uh start. We just practice at my house. Actually, sometimes we park a little uh, keyboard player named Marcus House. I used to call Goo with different beats. I used to be in the basement like a boxer with my boots on, ankle weights on. I would call Goo and. On the phone, like, how you like this beat? And certain beats, uh, Pump It, we had a song, Pump It Baby, all that stuff came to me in my basement. You know, like I said, I thought I was a boxer. And the beats were just flowing, coming to me. Because again, I never listened to, I never listened to the Congo. So most of my show would be Jungle Boogie and the little bit of beats I made in the basement. We had a show at the Howe Theater. 
<laughs> and why I'm don't know how to tune nothing. Over there, mess with the first Congo. Any Congo player know you tighten too much on one side, that lug is gonna pop. <laughs> that that lug pop. I cried like a baby. I was crying. Remember, I was only 14, <laughs> 14 years old. Cry like a baby. And Googie came over there. Don't you know? Don't worry about it. So you know, Googie working on cars. He know how to hook things up. So what he did was took uh, some grip pliers and pulled it down, and then tightened it somehow, and put another pair of lock pliers on there and kept it in place. <laughs> so I can play that that first show. Uh, like I say, uh, reality. I was there for weeks, like maybe two a year, year and a half. And and somehow in between, Red and the Boys manager and and Real, Red and the Boys in reality, we used to play Terry Franklin, rest in peace of Terry Franklin. We used to uh, have shows together or whatever. And you know, Terry used to keep some equipment in my basement sometimes. And um, anyway, my thing was, okay, I think I want to make some money doing this. With reality band, we was playing for, for sodas and hot dogs at the bus stop. You know what I'm saying? We, it was fun. I did, you know, you young, 14 years old, I mean, I just wanted to play anyway. Everybody just wanted to play, have fun. You know, as time went on, I said, I think, you know, I want to, I'm not, I guess not getting tired of playing for free, but to make some money doing what I was doing. Which would happen to go? I go to raise in which you made you made some money. It wasn't a lot of money, you know. We meet up up uh, Terry's uh, Terry mom's house over there uh, at Fort Davis something I think over there. We should meet up in a little alleyway right there, walk in the alley, raise everybody. Or we would sit over there on the basketball court to sit over there, and lean on the gate talking whatever whatever before we were going to practice. Like I said, we had I had a couple of shows, Moonlight and. Uh, whatever Reds would call us, uh, Capers. Um, did a lot of outside shows with Reds. I left, I was there for a short, a short period also. And from there, I went to uh, Air Raid Band. Well, what had happened, I, I, for somehow I got the word that Gold Timmy was going into service. He was going into service. And I think they was having trials, or they was looking at whoever come through, you know, try out. So I went out there, you know, to the practice a couple of times. So next day I know that I remember I was in a band, you know, Darren Grice, Brass's original keyboard player. He lived around the corner from, from me. And I would, you know, pick him up. We would go to practice. We played all, uh, you know, all the way out. We stayed out of Maryland, far out of Maryland. That was another uh, well, nice organization, Daryl Spencer. Rest in peace to Daryl. You know, they had the payroll thing going, you know, you kind of do your shows every week, do your shows week, weekend or whatever, during the week, and they call you in on practice, sign your name, get your get your money. Well, with the other bands, was none of that happened. It was, it was like, all right, here we go, here go 25, you know what I'm saying, here go hot dog, here go Coke soda. <laughs> stuff like that, but uh, Daryl and Doc ran a nice, a nice, uh, you know, we were old machine over there, Air Raid Camp, and um, we had a nice, nice thing going. My man, rest in peace, Ralph, trombone player. My man, Ralph, the China Boogie came after the uh, other saxophone player. Uh, I can't think his name. Doc, Darren, Keith, TQ, X from A, Boogie Dudes. Me and my man Daryl, Daryl, uh, Daryl Hall. Cause matter of fact, Daryl, when I when I went to go, that's the reason why I went to to raise. Daryl was there, and then when I got there, Daryl was going to air raid. So it was like I followed him again when I got to air raid. And um, we like I said, we stayed playing, opening up for wrestlers, doing them shows all the way down, moonlight in, all that stuff down that way. One night, um, down the Moonlight Inn, we opened up for our asses, and, um, something that happened to uh, Jungle Boogie's hand. And it was like, you think you could, I just finished playing, it was like, you think you can do, play play with us because something wrong with Ty's hand? You know, I ain't gonna say I'm tired of none of that. I was like, hell yeah, I can do it. <laughs> All the time, that's one thing I tell everybody, 
learn everybody's stuff back then. I mean, I could probably trouble. I probably get on stage to play with EU Trouble. I'm gonna say the main band, Reds. I could play disco. Any anybody stuff that I, you know, to me that was doing something like EU Reds Trouble, which T Bone is a hard percussionist to follow. But I mean, what you think he's playing is actually sometimes that's anybody. How you hear it is not how it's played. So. Anyway, they were like, can you sit down? I'm like, eh, you know, because me and Fuss was boys. Me and Fuss bowled together uh, back in 81. We was bowling. Bowling at uh, Bowling America. So, you know, he, cause, of course, again, I told you, I used to get on his drums all the time. So, we was boys. So, he was like, Sean, are you sure you can handle it? Da, 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 da. I was like, I got it. So, anyway, I played that night, which I knew all the songs. But after that show, I was supposed to somebody tired. Because back then, tempo was kind of fast, but you, I couldn't complain to him. Like, you, you know, you going too, you going too fast. You gotta, you gotta get with the program. Or you know, to me, it wasn't too fast or it wasn't too slow. Cause I, I, at that time, you know, the adrenaline, you playing with wrestlers, you, you playing with the number one. So uh, he, little Benny called me Go Go Mike the whole, whole night. Go Go Mike, that was my name the whole night. <laughs> I, I ain't kidding. He ain't got to get it straight. Because he did that later on, messing up after I've been in the band for some time. But anyway, called me Go-Go Mike. So after that, they knew I can play. So like I would go to the shows, like uh, they might play up St. John's. And it's, it was so funny how people were like, you playing tonight? He was like, nah, I ain't playing. Joe Boogie should be here. I'm just up here, you know, because I, I can get in now. I ain't got to pay to go. I ain't got to pay $5. I ain't gotta pay that money to go see RE. Cause back then you ain't, I don't care what band you, unless unless Miss McEnany was good with you or you came through that back door. I don't care what band you would say, I play with, like now, I play with such and such band, or they know you at the front door, they'll let you in. But that wasn't happening with Miss Mac. they ain't even care about that. Somebody came up, and they was, Lord, I know, it was like, can you come up to the, uh, to the Paragon? I wanna talk to you, you know? I want to talk to you guys. I come to Paragon of Georgetown. So I go up to the door uh, at the time where Miss Neal was working the door. And she didn't, I mean, she didn't know me. I didn't I didn't know her. I just, when I got there, my name was at the door. And they said, oh, okay, you go in. And I'm still with Air Raid at this time. After that, I went to Doc, Doc and him, and told him what was, what was great to happen. You know what I'm saying? When they asked you to play, I, I think you kind of knew they were going to ask you. How did you feel to accept that position with R.E.? Because they was one of the biggest bands at the time. I was like, sure, I'll drop any, you know what I'm saying? You know, you, you know, you give jobs two weeks, I was ready. Like, I ain't, ain't got to tell them that. No you know what I'm saying? That's that's how, you know, R.E. was. Right. I, mean, two, I don't care. Anybody probably would have did the same thing, but that's not how it worked with me. And I went back to docking them, you know. You know, you want to do this, you know, no how We still, you know, still love each other to this day. And um, I think my last show probably, I'm not for sure, I think it was uh, Super High School, one of them high schools. The rest has had a, uh, they had a, a meeting, I'm thinking. They had a meeting with me. Well, we, once I got in the band, called the Big Hats. The Big Hats was white boy, uh, um, funky name, Foots. You know, Donnell ain't want me in the band. Donnell would vote me out, but out his his vote ain't really count. So he, I think, real foots, foots, and plus me playing, sitting in, they knew I can play with the band. After that, I was just going to band practice, sitting in the band practice playing. It was so funny. Back then, I, I used to sit. Never for some reason, what the whole set, the whole set of Congos was wasn't at practice. There's two con white Congos on the floor, and I used to sit down. And then that's when I started to get speed in my hands. I had these little cheap ankle weights. The ones, the same ones I had on reality. I had a little blue. And I used to get my speed from sitting down just playing on two big combos. So, and if Fuss had a white drum set, which was a five piece, it wasn't, wasn't this set, because they had, the, you know, the rest had the big truck. All the equipment stayed in the back yard and everything else. Well, they had the organ and a couple of keyboards downstairs. They could bring that stuff in. And I just remember sitting down practicing all the time on them, them two white Congos till they finally brought some, some in. And 
I did 28 years. What was your first show with IE? First, I got a problem with remembering that. It's either the High Up Theater or the Panorama Room. So I'm thinking it's the High Up Theater, because uh, a matter of fact, it was funny, because uh, Rudy, Minnesota Fest, he came and picked me up. They told me to dress, so I got dressed up. And he was like the whole time, you sure they told you to wear that? <laughs> I might have some blue pumps or something, some blue suede pumps, some black pump shoes. Cause he kept saying that the whole, you, you sure they told you to wear this thing? So I, I think it was the how the how the theater was my first show. When you first started playing with RE, why did they turn your Congos to face foot? I remember that. I have no idea. At the time, you had one of the biggest shoes to fill, which was Jungle Buggy. I thought it was you had to prove yourself and then they'd turn them around. Or I thought it was maybe Foots was showing you the beat, but I never knew why you hey, were the only day. I'm glad you just told me, reminded me, because I, I, I don't know. I mean, but that set me in the back. I don't care. I'm playing with RE, but. And then the only thing I do remember is like, they were like, do you want these, these combos? Which was the big four. Ty had the big four combos. My I played, out of fact, I got a cut still on his finger, but it's not like it was. Playing on those jumps, I said, no, I don't want them. So they end up, that's why I tag out them. They gave them the tie. I mean, they end up giving the tie, end up buying, getting new, you know, coons. But I remember that now since you said they had me facing them. So I really don't know why. <laughs> and also, when you first started playing, they still was yelling, Jungle Boogie. I'm sure that was more of an incentive, like, man, I got, I, I know I got these shoes to fill, but I also got to prove myself, too. Well, that was, that was, you know, I used to get mad at that. Like, and Fush was like, you can't get, Fush was the main one who pumped me up. I was like, you can't get mad, you got, you got to make a name for yourself, Charlie. That stayed with me. You got to make a name for yourself. And I guess I made a name for myself. But that was, that song was specifically about you. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, most of the songs that, that, uh, at that time, coming to the band, Funk would bring most of the the songs, you know. And that was Funk's idea. That's how that, that came up. Like I said, most of the songs that come on stage, Funk was, let's say, learn this. And that was his idea. And that was another, that was another one that stayed on my, you know, stayed on my case to make sure I got, got my name out there. That beat to lock it. How did that beat come about? Man, argument, me and Funk. Got mad about something, so I just thought, he was like, keep it right there. And I'm like, man, are you serious? And I'm mad at the same time. Just kept playing and kept playing the beat. And he, he and it turned out to be a hit. <laughs> oh well, me and him being mad at each other on stage. <laughs> nah, well, only thing with me, my, my beats really come from stage. On stage, um, to this day, I don't really, I don't really. I can't, I, don't, I can't ever say I made a beat up sitting at home since my reality days. Most of the time, when we're re in the beginning, was one on one, you know, all the old hits. You might throw a song in there, we didn't really make too many songs up till later on, coming up, you know, like Hey Buddy Buddy and stuff like that came a little while later after I got in. But it wasn't, it wasn't hard. It wasn't like, well, you gotta make a beat. I mean, that's like I knew I couldn't play, you know what I'm saying, a one on one. Unless it's like, Funk would have you play the one-on-one, -on -one, cause if you hear uh, the Dougie Fresh jump, that's the, he wanted the one-on-one -on -one beat inside of the drum. Everything was, the one-on-one -on -one beat was in that song. Other than that, you was free to do what you, you know, make what, up what you wanted to make up. What about the tighten up beat? Tight, that, that just came to me. That that came off of, and when we first started doing, um, do, do the Mickey, I was playing almost a back up against the wall beat. If you listen to it in the beginning. And then out of somewhere, <laughs> somewhere <laughs> the Drake's in the Metro Club <laughs> came tighten up. The tighten up beat came. Every band I know plays tighten up beat in their song to this day. Dirty old beat. Like I say, <laughs> the proof is in the tape. The proof. <laughs> I mean, where it came from first, the, uh, anything, anything anybody makes, the proof is in the tape. So. That's how old it is. You've been non-stop from your first conversation about how you got in the game. I don't think you've taken a break from playing yet. No, no, no breaks, man. That's a vacation. I mean, you <laughs> take off a week. I, you know, the, only, the longest break I ever had is when I had a car accident back around 90. 
91, I think that was, I was out for, I mean, other than a month. But I was right back, you know, back playing. But no, no stop playing with a band and then came back type of thing. I always been playing. I think that's incredible because the drummer and the percussionist do not get a break in Go-Go. And to me, they should be, they should be the most talked about because they the one that's really putting the work in of you. I mean, you got the, the talkers that's doing something, but without that beat, just say, if you, you know, we got a thing, uh, D. Floyd should say, man, y'all can't do nothing without me. So, me and I used to tell Jeff, let's stop playing. <laughs> let's stop for one minute. Go ahead, <laughs> let me see what you're gonna do. You can't do nothing. There's nothing you can do without that, the drum percussionist. So that's my thing, the drummer and, and the percussionist is the, the most important on that stage when it comes to go-go anyway. Who was your favorite drummer? At the foot? Including foots. Oh, foots. <laughs> <laughs> when I would tell you who was the hardest drummer, I love his style so much. I wanted to take drum lessons, man. Back when, when I was doing my Coliseum days, and it was red hot EU. Oh my God, Sugarfoot, Ricky Wellman. <laughs> I used to go get the, get the tapes from the Coliseum or any tape with him on it. And, and it was a music store out there behind Chuck's, uh, right next door to uh, Jerry's on the back street behind Chuck Levels. I, I forgot that main road back there. But anyway, uh, my grandma used to take me to drum lessons out there. And I used to go on there and say, I want to play this <laughs> right here. And they was like, Who is this guy? You know, who is that? And I said, That's Sugarfoot. So I want to learn, you know, learn that. But anyway, that was the, I got on stage with Chuck one night. And all I can do, I can even play the beat because I'm, I'm looking at Rick. You know what I'm saying? I got I got Rick and Shilly E in my in my bio on my you know on my uh, in my on my website. Right. So that's the two intact Jungle Boogie. That's my three favorite: Shilly E, Sugarfoot, and Jungle Boogie. Foots, uh, you know, of course Foots because most of the drummers that I play with after that, that's basically where they you know almost got their their style from. Except Jeff. Jeff said he. he he, I mean, he, he can like Juju, but he don't play like Juju. <laughs> and, I mean, not when it comes to that pocket. You know what I'm saying? He, I mean, sound like foot with them. I love them doubles. When it comes to them double beats, oh my God. People probably don't know this. You, you played with a reggae band. A uh, soldier. Soldier, yeah. Soldiers at War. I and think was that was at the clubs uh, 66. They are from Virginia, actually. Uh, young, young dudes. And I haven't seen them, so when I walk in the room and see Five white young guys with dreadlocks. White guys with dreadlocks. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was something, something new to me. And they like, yo, you know, we like go go and we had a song we want you to play on. I said, cool. So it was on after that. I mean, they stay, they stay traveling. They, they making that, making that money. I did like two, two other songs with them, but that was the first one that I did. I'm sorry was the name of the song. Sorry. I tell people this all the time. A lot of people that came in the go go, like you said, we didn't get a dollar. We made a play for some gas money to Eddie Lennox. As far as the love, I think that attributes to why you've been playing for this long is the love of the music. Oh yeah, you got it. You got to love. You got to love the music to order to keep going. You know, they have longevity. You got to love what you do. That's in anything. So I love. Like in the beginning, I just wanted to play. I still want to play. I can't wait to get to the show and play. And another thing that motivates me too are that the, the younger combo players keep bringing something new. So my thing is to elevate higher than them. But they motivate me to do that. When I see you, like, oh, I got, I got to, you know, you got, I got to stay with, with them. That's another thing. You got to, like, you love, I love the music and I love what the young dudes doing to keep me, really keep me going. It's a shirt. They got junk y'all. I got everybody on the shirt today. Not, I don't say everybody. Any other band, I didn't been on that stage. I don't know. I was on the road. I was like Lil Wayne. I was on. <laughs> I was like I was on everybody's show. Which got to the point where Chuck was like, if Rob not here or then when Mo came, if they not here, you are playing. I'm like, cool. <laughs> it didn't make me no different. How did it feel when you got that LP, the Lap Percussion endorsement? Man, that was a big. That was big. And um, through the help, Yolanda, uh, she had put put something together with everything I did. You know. Got with the people. Next thing I know, they sent that contract. All I had to do was sign my name. Next thing I know, I was, it was I opened the doors, Con was on the porch. I'm like, man, y'all know where I live at? <laughs> Let me know. I'm probably the first to make a um, go-go Congo 
on record. I made my, I was the first one to do that back in 90, 91. People don't realize like back in the 70s and 80s, you rarely used the high Congo. The high Congo came later on. Yeah, that's, that, the high Congo came way later on. That's why I can sit back and play in the pocket all, all night. Don't, don't even, I can play the whole night without the high, but the, the people ain't gonna like it because that's the new thing. Right. You gotta have that, that high, the, the, even a lot of talkers. Don L was like that. You gotta get on the phone, call somebody. Get, you need a high one for what? <laughs> I can play the same beat on these three, right here. You just gonna be missing that. I mean, they just fell in love with the high one. But the pocket is where it's at. Do you see retirement in your future? Nah, I don't know. God willing, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not feeling bad at all, so. I'm not gonna get, never get tired of it. You know, a lot of times, I know a, a lot of people, I, I can say this, a lot of people playing, they probably get tired of going to the same place early we playing. I mean, but once, like me, once I get there, I'm gonna give you my 100, 110. I might feel this way, you know what I'm saying? You might be working all day. But you know, once once you get on that stage, this is a whole different ball game for me. Is there anything you wanna shout out or put out out there to the GoGo community? Try to be professional about any, you know, what you do. Cause, uh, and I always try to give you 100% because you you never know who's in the crowd watching. You might, you might never, you never know who's gonna give you that call. You know, they say practice makes perfect. It's practice makes better. That's, that's what I said. My bad, go go Mickey in the building. Thank you for stopping through there, Big Mickey. No problem, we went past hours. No, no. I got five hours <laughs> for you. <laughs> I'm used to it. Yes, sir. <laughs>